Good morning, class. Today I want to finish up our talking about animal body plans. We start briefly talking about segmentation. Segmentation is a very large um, evolutionary advantage. It actually is a serial repetition of similar body regions. So if you think about beads on a string, each one of those represents a subsect, a duplication of a body part. You can see it obviously externally in insects or earthworms, but only internally in things like muscle bands and fishes. Here's a good example of what segmentation looks like in each one of these animals. You can see that externally in the earthworm, the rings that comprise its body and give the entire phyla its name. You can also see it in Arthropoda and this, this lobster. You can see how the body is in segments that go from one end of the animal to the other. And in fish, you can see it the serial repetition of muscle bands and vertebrae along the length of the animal internally. Okay, one other thing to talk about is the idea of how complexity is related to body size. So if we look at the trend in animal evolution over time, we can see that the average animal tends to get larger and larger as it moves from a simpler form of cellular organization to a much more complex form of organ system organization. Now there's a lot of advantages to the whole, to the whole evolution of larger body sizes. As an animal gets larger, its surface area increases as a square of its body length, its volume increases as a cube of its body length, which means that it gets its volume gets larger faster than its square area, its surface area. And that has a lot of implications as to how the animal evolves and what processes it evolves. So a large animal has a less surface area compared to its volume. That means that its surface area alone will be inadequate to allow for uh, at respiration just through the skin. So if you look at small animals, most of the way these really tiny animals breathe is that they take in oxygen directly from the environment across their membrane, their skin membrane. For larger animals, that's much more impractical because there's just not enough surface area to bring enough oxygen and nutrients into the interior of their body. And what you begin to see as you move further along the evolutionary track of animals is that they begin to develop folds or imaginations to the body surface that increase surface area and allow for cells deep in the interior of the animal to, um, to get access to oxygen and nutrients. And you'll see the similar sort of evolution of internal transport systems. Think of kidneys or the digestive system where the, square, where the surface area of the internal organ systems gets much larger to make it more efficient to shuttle nutrients, gases, and waste products back and forth into the animal and out. But that said, there's a lot of benefits for being large. First of all, it's easier to handle big changes in the environmental fluctuations. So if you're an elephant, it's easy for you to handle a cold day or a warm day than if you were a tiny, uh, tiny protozoa. It also allows for protection against predators and promotes your, promotes your ability to fight back. So elephants have few predators because they're too large for most predators to take a chance attacking. And finally, the advantage of having a large body size is it makes it easier to maintain your body temperature through environmental fluctuations. And that means that you have a more efficient way of maintaining body temperature, the core temperature, and it also leads to the ability for you to use relatively less energy to move a gram of body weight. If we look at the net cost of running in mammals, you can see that the larger the animal, the larger the mammal, or the larger the body weight, the less energy it needs to have per gram to run that, that particular animal. So a white mouse being very small has a large 
surface area relative to its volume, it has a higher metabolic rate and it needs more oxygen. As we move down towards the scale from a white mouse for a kangaroo rat all the way through dog, human to horse, each successive animal is larger and it thus it needs less oxygen relative to its body size. So it's a much more efficient way of running your respiration process if you have a larger body form. Okay, well, let's move on to the next subject. The next subject has to do with systematics and phylogeny. And I'm going to drop a video this week that'll talk a little bit about, um, about systematics and phylogeny. But for now, I just want to briefly go over some of the major concepts. We'll be talking about what systematics is, giving a few definitions. We'll talk about a cladogram. Talk about different types of evolutionary um, phylogenies. Look at the whole idea of derived versus ancestral characteristics. Come up with some examples of other ways of analyzing phylogenetic relationships. We talked about taxicloud classification or old rendered binomial system and then we'll look a little bit at uh, comparative biology homologous versus analogous structures and then finally and most importantly we'll talk about a roadmap for the rest of the semester okay all organisms are comprised of one or more cells we know that we carry out metab metabolic processes that transfer energy with atp and they encode hereditary information in their DNA. And we know there's a tremendous diversity of life. They all basically have that characteristic. And what we usually do when we want to try and group organisms is trying to group them in groups based on shared characteristics within the organism. So you think of a horse as all horses have certain characteristics that they share among their different subspecies. We group those together. All bears have the same characteristics. All goldfish have the same characteristics. So that we tend to group them on shared characteristics. And how we derive what a shared characteristic is is very important. Okay, first of all, let's talk about a few terms. We know that when we try and go back and figure out the history of, a, of an animal, how it evolved, what it evolved from, and what its likely hood of evolutionary future will be, the false record itself isn't complete, so we have to do a lot of hypothesizing and a lot of inference from its related species. So the whole idea of figuring out how animals are related to each other is a branch of biology that's called systematics. It's the study of evolutionary relationships among different groups of animals. Now, when we come up with a hypothesis, hypotheses about how animals are related to each other, we call this a phylogeny. We think of it as sort of a family tree. We hypothesize how animals actually relate to each other, what those patterns of relationship are. And finally, in a slightly related thing, once we know what animals, how animals related, that really gives us the ability to give them a label. We post a label, like a binomial um, nomenclature on each species which represents its relationship to other species. This is the practice and the science and classification of organisms and it's called taxonomy. So systematics, phylogeny, and taxonomy. Okay, we'll look at systematics. Let's go back to Darwin. Darwin figured that all species came from a common ancestor. He thought of this conceptually as a history of life is a branching tree. So if we go out and we can see trees out in the, in the side yard, that's the way he met, actually imagined them. Now he drew a diagram to represent this branching tree relationship among species, and this diagram is called a cladogram. So if we look at a cladogram, the twigs of the tree represent species that exist now. The joining of the twigs and branches represents the pattern of common ancestry. So each branch represents the common ancestor with two twigs that follow it. Darwin called this process descent with modification. This is what he means by that. It's a way of representing the common ancestor and the descending uh, descendants 
each uh, species. So the whole idea of analyzing these um, branching tree structures is an approach that's called cladistics. It's an approach to biological classification where you organize organisms into groups that are called clades. And those groups are based on the most recent common ancestor. So a clade is the name of a group, and it can have a formal name like a class, or it can have a more informal name. And when we go through the course, we'll be using both the formal groupings and the informal groupings as well. And when we use a cladogram, what we're trying to do is that we take a we make a phylogenetic tree that represents our hypothesized relationship amongst the different groups that we're looking at. So here we have three different uh, cladograms that represent hypothetical phylogenies. They represent the relationship between a uh, gibbon, gibbon here, a human, a chimp, gorilla, and orangutan. You can see in each one of these versions, they represent where the split between the constituent <coughs> species are. So in this first one, we can see that the human and the chimp are very closely related. They have a common ancestor here. And then the gorilla splits off somewhere before the humans and the chimp split off. And we can see that true for all these phylogenies. But then if you go further back, you can see that the relationship amongst the gorilla, the chimp, and the human to its more previous uh, ancestors, the um, orangutans and the gibbons, fall in different locations. Each one of these represents a slightly different relationship among the five species. And we can use these cladograms to represent that, and these will change depending on the degree of knowledge we have about each one of these um, relationships. Okay, so the important thing about interpreting a phylogenetic relationship is looking how recently the species share a common ancestor. Remember we said that physical similarity doesn't necessarily accurately represent how animals are related to each other. So early systematists relied on the expectation that the greater the time between two ancestors diverging from a common ancestor, the more different they would be. This is immediately um, contradicted when we look at things like birds and bats. They physically seem very similar, but as we know, bats and birds are very distantly related to each other. They share a common ancestor way back when, but they're not very closely related at all. So we had to have ways of really identifying So, as we said before, evolution can occur at different rates. It can occur rapidly at one time and slowly at another. So if we look at this, this is, this is a gradualist revolu uh, evolutionary diagram where animals change slowly over time. And on the right is a punctuated evolutionary phylogeny where animals will change suddenly or very rapidly from one species state to another. Now we can look at the patterns that we see in evolutionary time. We can see a number of interesting ones that repeat themselves over and over again through the history of life. There's one that's called oscillating selection, and that's where adaptive traits kind of evolve in one direction and then evolve back into a different state. This is really associated with rapidly changing environmental conditions that can change the uh, utility of an adaptive trait very quickly. So if we looked at an, an example that we would be familiar with, one we talk about later on, Galapagos ground finches have two or three different uh, shapes of beaks within one species, and this is because the wet dry season favors different seed sizes and thus allows differing individuals of the same species to better exploit a changing environment. Then the next um, 
pattern that we know is convergent evolution. And we can see this a lot as we go through the evolutionary history of animals. Evolutionary doesn't always diverge from each other. If you see animals that are inhabiting a similar habitat, that habitat may evoke and impose such strong selective pressures that all the animals in it end up looking very similar. And therefore, you end up with an adaptive trait that appears in two distantly related species. I use the bird and the bat wing as an example. Another good example would be whales and dolphins compared to fishes. They're all entirely aquatic animals. They need to stay in the water all the time. And because of that, the uh, selective pressures of a water environment force a similar body shape and size and mode of transport on them. They're both basically torpedo-shaped body forms with fins that allow them to push their way through the water. Finally, there's a the concept of evolutionary reversal. And this is when a species re-evolves the characteristics of an ancestral species. So a good example of this would be an ostrich. One of the things that we talked about when we talked about the Cretaceous extinction event is that when most of the dinosaurs um, went extinct, they left open niches. These open niches allowed animals, mammals certainly, but also birds, the remaining dinosaurs, to occupy new niches. And one of the niches that was left empty was for large grassland-like animals exploiting these these vast expanses of semi-arid environment. And in order to do that, selective pressures push ostrich ancestors to become much larger and to lose their ability to fly so they can better exploit these large grassland areas. Evolutionary reversal. Okay, how do we define distinguishing characteristics? Well, we look at two different terms here. There's the derived characteristic, which is a similarity that's inherited from the most recent and common ancestor of the entire group. And there's the ancestral characteristic, which is a similarity that occurred much further back in the group, much further back than the common ancestor. And I will give you examples of each one of these. Let's talk a little bit about a cladogram because we use these derived and and ancestral characteristics to build these cladograms. So we try and look at these characters. We, we try and define whether they are ancestral or derived. We build a clade, and basically group them together in these clades. So the species that share a common ancestors are pushed into one clade. And the trait that we use in order to create this clade is the specific derived character that we've chosen. And that specific, specific derived characteristic is called a synapomorphy. So you'll see derived characteristics, derived characters in synapomorphy used interchangeably, but really synapomorphy is a derived characteristic that we've used to generate a hypothetical clade that groups all these animals together. There's a lot of different characteristics or characters that we can choose, pretty much any aspect of the phenotype may be used, the morphology, we can also look at behavior, we can look at um, physiology. But when we choose a character, we should make sure that it exists in a, in a recognizable absence present states. So for instance, teeth in amniovertebrates, we'll talk about what an amniovertebrate is, but basically any vertebrate that lays eggs has two uh, states in it. Teeth are present in most mammals and reptiles and absent in birds and turtles. So that would represent a recognizable character state that we can use to group mammals and reptiles into one and birds and turtles into another clade. So the example of an ancestral versus a derived characteristic the presence of hair in mammals is a shared derived feature of mammals. It would, considered, it would be considered to be a synapomorphy. The presence of lungs in mammals is an ancestral feature. That's because all mammals have lungs, 
but also all reptiles and most amphibians have lungs as well. So it's a shared characteristic that goes back further than the common ancestor for mammoths. If we do our cladistics, we can see that there's, um, we can see amongst these uh, seven or seven, amongst these seven um, different species here, they cover a wide range of uh, chordates. They're all chordates, but of course they're entirely quite different. And as we move along the uh, phylogenetic tree, each one of these bars represents a adaptive feature that separates the animals that have passed that dividing line from the animals that are before it. So for example, if you look at a lamprey, a lamprey and all the other chordates have a common ancestor. And the difference between the lamprey branch of the phylogenetic tree and the branch that led to all the other um, organisms is the evolution of a jaw. If you look at a lamprey, and we will at some point, we'll see instead of having a jaw, they have a circular hole in the front of their face. So the common ancestor for lampreys and, and uh, all the other uh, chordates had no jaw. The lamprey maintained that um, distinction. And then the ancestor for all the other um, groups here evolved the jaw. And you can see that as we move along for each one of these characteristics. Another thing to think about is the concept of homoplasy. It's a shared character trait that hasn't been inherited from an ancestor. And it usually is a result of convergent evolution or evolutionary re reversal. So, of course, that would then bring up mind again the bird and the bat wing, but there's a number of different examples we can think of. But think of homoplasy as, as a shared character state that results from convergent evolution. And think of a bird and the bat as being a good example of that. Now, when we look at all these different character states and choose different characters, there may be a certain degree of confusion, but it's important to realize that the conflicts, when you have conflicts among character states that you want to choose to build your phylogenetic relationship, use the principle of parsimony, which basically means it favors a hypothesis that requires the fewest assumptions. So you don't need to get very elaborate or very sort of blue sky to figure out what the relationships are. Just use the simplest relationship and use that as the degree of determining exactly what the relationships are. Okay, here's another cladogram. It relates um, amphibians, uh, reptiles, mammals, and within mammals, it relates the tigers, the gorillas, and the humans. And again, what we're looking at, if we're looking at the difference between the ancestor for this the salamanders and frogs and all the other um, chordates, we can see that what really broke off is the evolution of the amniotic membrane. We'll learn what an amniotic membrane is in the future, but just remember the amniotic membrane represents a big break in this line of chordates. It's basically the evolution of external in the case of lizards and internal in the case of tigers, gorillas, and humans, internal eggs. Now there are other ways of defining phylogenetic relationships. Sometimes characters evolve rapidly and you have to be careful when you use a principle of parsimony. One of the ways we can actually get at that is to measure the rate at which parts of our DNA evolve over time. Now, when you look at mutation that occurs in the DNA, it's not something that occurs at a single point in time. What happens is, as you know, DNA is a series of, of gene pairs, and those are a series of nucleotide pairs that, that run along this long linear molecule. And what happens is you get mutations in sequences of genes, the sequences of nucleotide pairs. And if those aren't deleted by natural selection, they can actually stay present from one species to another. This means that parts of these can actually remain constant through time 
And by applying statistical approaches, we can develop what we call a molecular clock. We can see the rate at which certain parts of the DNA evolve and certain parts of the DNA remain static. And that allows us to measure how old or how old a particular line or species may be. So it's important to realize when you have an molecular clock, the rate of evolution of a particular molecule remains constant over time, and it's something we can actually see in the DNA. All right, when we think about taxonomic classifications, we have to think about the whole concept of different groupings. So how we place the species and higher groups into their relationships among each other, into the taxonomic hierarchy. We'll move into actually talking about some of those formal teams like terms like genus and family and class. But let's first classify the different types of phylogenetic relationships that we see. Oops. Okay, we talked about we're talking about monophyletic, paraphyletic, and polyphyletic groupings. So a monophyletic grouping is a grouping that shares all the members of a group, including a common ancestor. The paraphyletic uh, grouping involves sharing only some of those ancestors, but not all of them in that group. Some of the members of the group, but not all of them. And finally, a polyphyletic group doesn't include the most recent concept common ancestor of all the members of the groups. And we'll see this as we actually look at some diagrams. So cladograms are diagrams based on those shared characteristics. So we can look here, we can use these cladistics to use to um, develop these. So when we're defining monophyletic taxa, we look for the most recent common ancestor for all of these, and that would be this one over here. And we use that to figure out what type of phylogenetic grouping we're talking about. I mentioned before the monophyletic group. This represents a monophyletic grouping. So when we include the common ancestor for all the dinosaurs, including both the ones that went extinct plus the ones that are present to today in birds, plus the most um, the closest relationship to that whole dinosaur grouping being the crocodiles. All of these share a common ancestor and that's a monophyletic group. So you've basically created a phylogenetic grouping that includes all of the dinosaurs plus living and dead, plus the most common ancestor, which is a crocodile. Contrast that with a paraphyletic grouping in which we leave out the crocodiles and the hawks. This would be the sort of grouping you probably would have seen about 40 or 50 years ago, back when people didn't realize how closely related to dinosaurs crocodiles are, or the fact that birds were actually dinosaurs in and of themselves. So when you have a grouping like that, it's a paraphyletic grouping. You don't have, you have the common ancestor over here but you don't include the members of the entire grouping. So you leave some of them out. So you have this, which represents only a partial grouping of this whole group of dinosaurs, which is this. When you have a polyphyletic grouping, then you have a grouping where you have two different groups of animals that are pushed together and they're from distant related uh, groups. So this polyphyletics are basically poly meaning many um, phyla. And a bat and a hawk would be a good example. The only reason you'd be pushing them together is if you were doing a study on homologous structures. They aren't closely related to each other even though they do have physical similarities and a bat and a bird in the same grouping together would be considered a polyphyletic grouping. All right, so we'll talk about 
homologous versus analogous structures because we use phylogenetics to really give us the ability to develop comparative biologies about different animals. Let's think about the difference between a homologous and analogous structure. Homologous structures are structures that derive from the same ancestral horse. And a good example would be a horse leg, a dolphin flipper, and a human arm. They all have the same ancestral limb structure and they evolve for different functions and different shapes. If we look at analogous structures, analogous structures are not are not um, derived from the same ancestral source. <clears throat> and a good example would be the wing of a bird and the wing of a dragonfly. And then here too, in this particular picture, we look at a bird and a bat wing. And to the to the point that we're talking about, if you look at the actual physical structure, we can see that in the case of the bird wing, the bird wing the, the flying surface of the bird wing is basically a highly evolved um, arm structure. You can see here that the limb has been extended through time, and the fingers play very little uh, part in the actual bird wing structure. Whereas we look at a bat, we can see a bat wing is mostly composed of extended digits, so they're basically made out of its hand. So let's look at homologous structures. Homologous structures are structures where you have, they evolve differing shapes and functions, but they all came from a common limb structure. So we look at humans and horses and cats and bats and birds, and we can see each one of these has a distinct, um, a distinct structure that's distinctly different, used for different purposes. In the case of a human, you have a, a limb that's evolved highly um, mobile uh, phalanges or digits. In the case of a horse, all those phalanges have been shrunken down to one that's been greatly extended and is used for, um, for running across the grasslands. If you look at a whale, you can see that its, that its fingers have been evolved into their flipper shapes that allow it to push its way through the water. So all of these are homologous structures and these homologous structures all arose from one ancestral limb. When we look at the concept of comparative biology, we're talking about um, complex characters evolving through a sequence of evolutionary changes. So if I were to ask you what modern day birds have in their physiology, in their physical form that distinguishes them from other um, chordates, other vertebrates, you would say things like wings and feathers. They have very, very light bones. They have a hyper-evolved breastbone that allows the flight muscles to be anchored to it. And if we think about Thanksgiving, you're carving the breast of a turkey, and then you have the wishbone, and you have that big sort of keel that's, that the meat sits on top of. That's the breastbone, and those big pieces of meat that form the breast meat are the actual flight muscles that, put, that pull the wing. So additional stages of any particular character evolved as an adaptation to some selective pressure. So we look at an example, the first feather-like structure evolved in theropod phylogeny. So the first feathers were associated with dinosaurs that were not using them for flight at all. They were probably using them for insulation or maybe decoration. So if you look at the concept, the, if you look at the comparative biology using the phylogenetic tree, we can see how these derived characteristics slowly appeared through the selective pressures that led from the ancestral dinosaurs all the way up to modern birds. So if you look at modern birds, there are their earliest ancestors probably evolved light bones. And then after that, they evolved the wishbone feature and the breastbone, which allowed those larger flight muscles to, um, to, actually, um, to actually have a place to anchor. Then they allowed uh, for the evolution of downy feathers to give them greater insulative abilities. 
And then they had long arms and highly mobile wrists with feathers and veins and shafts. And if we remember our Jurassic Park, we remember the Velociraptor. Velociraptors were probably in the same grouping, in the same clade as birds. So when we saw the Velociraptors in the movie, those were bird ancestors. And finally, shortly after that, they evolved long aerodynamic feathers because now they're beginning to use feathers not just for insulation, but for powered flight. Their arms became much longer as the proto wings began to develop. And then the final uh, changes that we start to see that separate the earliest bird ancestor, Archaeopteryx, from modern birds, the loss of teeth and reduction of tail. All these represent um, derived characteristics that help to drive the evolution of birds from their earliest ancestor forms into a separate line, earliest dinosaur forms into a separate line that led to birds. Okay, let's think about binomial nomenclature. So when we, use, when we talk about taxonomy, the relationship amongst the different groupings, we have to find a way of using clear terms. So what we've done is that we've come up with a binomial nomenclature. Now I mentioned a Swiss, uh, Swiss, I'm sorry, a Swedish biologist whose name is Linnaeus. Back in the 1600s, he came up with a concept of binomial nomenclature. And we think about Homo sapiens as being our label for our species, but there's a lot that goes before that as well. So if we go here, it's a nested series of um, a nested series of terms that we use, of which species is the last one. The first one would be domain. So domain would be for us eukarya. All the eukaryotes fall into our domain. Then kingdom. Kingdom would represent the animal kingdom or plant kingdom, so we're all in the animal kingdom. And then phylum. Phylum is, as I said, there's 34 of them, and there's a large number of uh, animals that are represented in different phyla. So the phylum for us would be chordata, and then class, it would be mammalia, and then order, I think we're primates, and then the family, I think we're homidae, but we'll check that. And then the genus would be homo, and the species would be sapien. So we go all the way from the largest grouping, which is domaining, domain, down through kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. The way to remember the order is to use a mnemonic, a mnemonic which I used to use in high school, did King Philip call out for goodness sake? Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So that's an important um, distinction and we'll see as we move through that we can use this for a very powerful understanding of the relationships among the different uh, animals. So we start off with domain, we go to kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And as we move from species all the way up to domain, we can see that the taxonomic groups are grouped into progressively larger categories. So as I said, the phylogenetic tree is a hypothesis of evolutionary relationships. We can use molecular biology to actually discern between more closely related um, groupings. So in this case, we're using DNA analysis and the concept of a molecular clock, that section of the DNA which doesn't evolve rapidly, to develop phylogenetic hypotheses based on these molecular comparisons. And using that, we can find some interesting characteristics that may be more representative of the actual relationships than we would have thought of by looking just at the physiology or the phenotypic um, expression. In this case, we can see that the brown bear and the polar bear are more closely related to each other 
than they are to the black bear or any of the other bears. We can see the giant panda is in a grouping that separates it from all the other bears within the uh, family of Ursidae. And then we can see, if we look at the common ancestral carnivore groups, and we compare all of these different bear-like uh, organisms, we can see that the raccoons and the pandas, again, form a much more distantly related grouping compared to all the other, other groups that fall into the, uh, into the grouping of Ursidae. Okay, so if you look at these studies of ribosomal RNA sequences, which is another way of using the molecular clock to discern relationships, it can show us that the mushroom we have in our refrigerator is much more closely related to us than we are to green plants, which I guess doesn't really say much. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about is this whole concept of animal taxonomy. We're going to be using this to develop a roadmap that will allow us to figure out where we are in terms of relationships amongst the different groups as we talk about the individual phyla. So if you were to take up your textbook, the Hickman A. All, if you look inside the cover, there's this diagram. Now at first when we look at this, it looks like it's extremely complicated, but all it basically is is a hypothetical um, evolutionary tree, a phylogenetic tree that's derived from the actual animals that exist on Earth. Now we can see that they fall into the 34 main phyla, and each one of these represents a, a different phyla. So here's chordates over here where we are. Let's see, annelids, that's where the earthworms are over here. Inside here, we can probably see arthropoda, those are beetles, so those are the arthropods. Then over here are cnidaria, which are jellyfish, and periphera, which are uh, sponges. Each one of these are a separate phyla. Now we're going to get further into the phyla, but let's look at the phyla now and then group them according to what we know about the evolution of these major characteristics. So we know that they're all in the phyla animalia, so they're all, I'm sorry, they're all in the kingdom animalia, so they're all animals. But we know from looking at their, at their um, embryonic development that there's a large grouping of them that are bilaterally symmetrical, and there's a small grouping they are not. So if we look at this, we can see, as we said, that the, the sponges, the periphera, and the cnidaria are not bilaterally symmetrical. So they and the other, about three or four other small groupings or phylum fall in one category, and then all the other uh, phyla are bilaterally symmetrical, so they fall into this grouping here. Then we look at those two groupings, and remember we had two major categorizations within those two groupings. There's the protostomes, where the mouths evolve, um, appeared first in the gastrula, and the deuterostomes, where the mouths appeared, where the anus appeared first in the gastrula. Those are major anatomical groupings that led to huge changes, a huge uh, numbers of different phyla within those different groups. So for the protostomes, protostomes have the largest number of phyla. This entire grouping here are protostomes. And then for the deuterostomes, there's only three phyla that form into that, that fall into that grouping. The echinoderms, the starfish, the hemichordatas, which is a very small phyla we'll talk about later on and all the chordates. These three phyla are deuterostomes. So during the embryonic development, when the gastro showed up, their anus showed up first. And then for all the other phyla within bilateria, they're protostomes. So when we finally look at that breakdown over here, within protostomia, there are also two major groupings as well. There's the dysozoa and the lophotrochozoa. Now, if we look at Lophotrochozoas, that's the first major group we'll be looking at after we move out of the, the sponges and the, um, and the jellyfish. Lophotrochozoas are distinguished by having either lophophores, which are 
um, feeding structures we'll talk about later on are trochozoan um, larvae, which are specific larvae that we will also talk about later on. But all the members of this particular grouping of Lofa trochozoa all have one of those two structures in common. Then if we move to the Ichthyozoa, the big thing they have in common is the ability to shed their outer cuticle or their outer skin. So if we think about a, uh, a crab, it can shed its, it can shed its, um, its exoskeleton and then grow a new one. That ability to shed their exterior cuticle is common for all the members of this group. These are all like dysozoans. So that's what we're going to be using as we walk through the animal kingdom. I've used this and I've actually brought it down to a more simplified form to make it easier to, to follow. But we can see all of these are animals. This large grouping, except for the two um, we talked about, the Nidaria, the periphera, and some minor ones, these are all bilaterally symmetrical. And then within the bilaterally symmetrical animals, they're either protostomes or they're deuterostomes. And then finally, um, within the protostomia, that's broken down into two big clades or groupings as well, lophotrochozoans or dysozoans. So we're going to be able to use this as we move through the animal kingdom and always refer back so we know where we are at any particular point in time in this huge phylogenetic uh, tree of life that we are now getting ready to explore. Okay, that's all I have for now. I think what I'd like to do is to post a quiz today that's based on this lecture. It will be due by the end of the day, so please get that in. And have a nice day. And again, if you have any questions, please email me. I'll be available at night through, through email.